And, uh, you know, I think everybody's looking forward to the plantation. Thank you. Thank you. You, you, I'm just changing the. Everybody see the slides all right? Yeah, okay, good. Um, thank you for joining us online. I can't see you because uh, I'm seeing my own slides here, so sorry about that. Um, I don't mind if you have questions, if you just uh, interrupt, I think it's the best way to do it. I won't take that personally. Um, and for everybody who's here in person, thank you for coming in person. Um, you, you were saying that most of these seminars you've been doing recently have been done purely online, which is okay. I think that's the new thing that we've all learned how to do, but I'm a little old fashioned. She said, do you want to visit USF um, to give a presentation? And I took that literally. I said, yes, I want to visit USF. I want to see your campus. I haven't been here before. I, um, I wanted to see the spaces. I know some people here, as you, you said, um, uh, we've been friends for a very long time. Um, I also happen to know one of your other professors who graduated from a very prestigious university and had, um, I think, an amazing uh, dissertation committee. Every one of the members of his dissertation committee was a real rock star. Um, so nice to see you, Mike. Um, um, but I, yeah, I, I'm familiar, uh, familiar enough with the faculty. I know a fair amount about the uh, institution, but I wanted to come and see it. I think that's a, that's a big deal. Uh, and just reciprocate anytime somebody wants to come back to Maryland. Mike, you sort of know what we look like. I don't know how often you come back, but anybody else who wants to visit us, we're happy to have you uh, and show you around. The project I want to talk to you about today is actually a joint effort between University of Maryland. So here's the people that either are or have been involved at Maryland and the Ohio State University. So both universities in this next door consortium. Maryland is the lead institution um, and the other institutions subcontract to us. USF is an affiliate of the next door institution. So Professor Zhang has some uh, projects that she's doing through next door. Um, and at Maryland, I'm the director at the Ohio State University. Dr. Seth Young is the director, also a Berkeley guy. So the, the Berkeley threads run deep in some some areas. Um, and then the other names are the students. Uh, at the beginning, Danae was working with me and Hui was working with Seth. Then Hui graduated and Sandeep joined at The Ohio State. Then he graduated and now Aishwarya is working with him and I have Joshua working with me. So um, it's, a, it's been a, we're probably in our third year now for the project and it's got at least another year to go. So it has a, a fairly long history to it. Um, and the you can, you can minimize it. I think there's a this thing here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't need to see those other controls. So. So um, what are we doing? Let me go. I'll just cover the the title again here real quick. Uh, local ADSB transmissions assess the performance air traffic at general aviation airports. So. Our focus is general aviation airports. So these are, these are the small airports around the country, not the big ones that you all fly in and out of that have the towers and search 747s and all that, but um, there are probably about 10,000 small airports across the country. They mostly serve general aviation traffic. They do some other kinds of traffic, business traffic and other things, but there's a lot of them. And they apply for funding every now and then from the federal government to help with infrastructure improvements. They might want to build a new runway, they might want to lengthen an existing runway. They might want to improve their taxiways. They might want to improve their terminal buildings. They don't have to pay for all of that themselves. They can apply for federal funding, but there are more people who want the money than there is money. And so there has to be some process of deciding, well, okay, is this a good investment or not? So they have to make an argument about what is the current capacity of their airport in some sense? Why is it being overly taxed? Um, in, from a capacity standpoint, and therefore, why do they need these improvements, and what is the situation going to be after the improvements? So they want to make those arguments. The problem with general aviation airports is that they don't have any data. There, there's no tower there. There's no automatic collection of any of the supporting data. They don't know how many aircraft are coming and going. They don't know what kind of aircraft they are. They don't know what time of day they're landing and taking off. They don't know any of those things. So um, the idea is to help support that effort by using um, 
data that are being transmitted from most of the fleet, including the general aviation fleet, and then use that to help support this capacity determination effort. So I said most of this already, but I wanted to keep the title up just so you kind of see how it connected there. Lots of, lots of airports, they need these capacity estimates. There are models for airport capacity, but for the most part, they're aimed at larger airports. So the, the knobs that you can turn in those models have to do with the artifacts that you would see at large airports. If you were to try to distinguish one small airport from another small airport in that model, you wouldn't have the opportunity to do it because there's no parameter in the model that allows you to distinguish between small airports. They have, you know, they have their details in terms of their runway configurations and their fleet mixes and all of that, but those aren't variables that are relevant for those bigger models. Um, we're not building the actual model. MITRE is doing that, but um, MITRE is going to figure out that in order for this model that they're envisioning to work, they have, they have to have a certain amount of supporting data, and then it's our job to help come up with the ideas for what that data infrastructure would look like. So we are using ADSB and in particular ADSB out. So I don't know. Um, I've been working in aviation long enough now. I have started to take aviation things for granted, and I just assume that when I'm talking to people, they they know what I'm talking about. And then when I go to a more general transportation uh, and, uh, audience, or even a more general civil engineering audience, I have to remind myself. I have to slow down, tell people what this stuff means. So. Aircraft, if they want to fly in certain classes of airspace in the United States and Europe and just about everywhere else, are required to have a transponder on board. That, and there's a couple of different kinds of transponders. Some of them broadcast when they are interrogated. So a ground station sends a message into the air and it says, hey, if you're up there, send me a message back telling me who you are, where you are, what your altitude is, what your heading is, all these other things. Some of them do that. Others, like ADSB, they don't need to be interrogated first. They just send about twice a second a message out into space. They don't care who hears it. They say, here's who I am. Here's my call sign. Here's my heading. Here's my ground speed. Here's my elevation, my latitude, my longitude. And they have fairly good measurements of all of those things. They're getting, as you can imagine, if you're a plane flying at 30,000 feet, imagine how good your GPS signal is, right? Pretty good. There's nothing in the way. You can probably see 16 satellites. It's all quite good. Um, of course, we have radar on the ground. The radar on the ground is not as accurate as the as the GPS in the air. So a plane knows its own position better than somebody else knows the position of the plane. So if the plane can learn its own position and then tell other people what its position is, that works better. So we learn a lot about them that way. And also, it's very useful for planes that are flying in areas where you can't have those ground radars. So you're in Tampa, Florida, which is a very good place to, to illustrate this. Suppose you wanted to fly directly from Tampa, Florida to Galveston, Texas. Where would you fly? Over the Gulf of Mexico. Guess how many radar installations there are in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico? None. So if you're not careful, nobody knows where you are. So you have to tell people where you are, and there has to be something listening. There are satellites that are listening to these signals, but there are also stations on the ground that are listening to these signals. And in fact, there are hobbyists that are listening to these signals. Um, it was probably an unwise choice in the long run, but the protocol used to transmit these signals is not, um, uh, there's no security attached to it. it uh, anybody can listen, anybody can figure out where these planes are. So hobbyists buy these little radios and they hook them to their computers and they can track Planes. You can make a website that shows planes flying all over the country. Uh, it, uh, there's a lot of that. And our presumption is that this is a good way to collect the data that these small airports need, but in particular, they need these installations on site at the airport. Uh, there are lots of these ADSB receivers around the world, and there is a crowdsourcing effort going on right now where people who install you can buy one of these these radios you can install it at your house and if that's the only thing you had then you would only be able to see the air traffic that your antenna would receive so what you do is you subscribe to this service where as long as you agree 
that your radio is going to send information to some master database someplace, in addition to seeing your local traffic, you also get to see what everybody else is. So it's the typical crowdsource economies of scale that works quite well. So you can get a picture of the air traffic across the country just by subscribing to one of these data services. The problem is it's not as detailed as you think it is. And in particular, when the aircraft get very low to the ground, you can't see them anymore. Because in all likelihood, trees and buildings and things like that are blocking the signal. Um, so you have to have the you have to have the equipment installed at the airport so that it has line of sight visibility to the runway so that as the planes are uh, taking off and landing on the runway, um, they can see it. There's a few other problems. Most of the crowdsourcing consolidators. Um, so these aircraft are broadcasting about twice a second. And then you just have to think about, well, how many aircraft are in the United States flying around at any given time? You know, 100,000 probably, if you count all the GA aircraft and the commercial aircraft, there's a lot. And every one of them twice a second saying where they are, it's, it's a lot of data. Um, so what do these consolidators do? They filter it. It gets filtered. They have a certain audience that they're trying to address, which is mostly the person who wants to know where this commercial flight is in the air as it's on its way from LaGuardia to Denver or whatever, right? And if you miss a few transmissions every now and then along the way, that's fine. You still know roughly where the plane is. I mean, a plane flying at 600 miles an hour at 30,000 feet, you know. At any given second, you can predict where it's going to be two seconds from now. You could miss three of those transmissions. It wouldn't matter. And the consolidators know this. So they filter out the data. They, they, you know, they're only presenting to the to their customers a small fraction of what they collect. And they might even be erasing it before they store it because they want to archive it, but you don't want to archive any more than you have to. So there's a lot of problems if you just want to buy into the data feed. It's not that good. You can have your own local data feed where you have control over everything and you're getting the transmissions all the way down to the ground. You can see all the local traffic. Um, then that works pretty well. So we've made that argument at four airports. This one is right next. This is the College Park. So right next to the university that I work at, um, Ohio State has a unit has an airport on campus, so they have a flight school and a, and a campus airport. Um, this is Republic Airport uh, uh, in Long Island, in Farmingdale, and this is Grand Forks, North Dakota. What you think of Grand Forks, North Dakota? What's going on in North Dakota? Technically, the busiest general aviation airport in the country, and during a couple of small time slices during COVID, the busiest airport in the United States in terms of just counting aircraft taking off and landing. Busier than Atlanta, busier than JFK, busier than Newark, busier than all of them, because there's a lot of small aviation traffic happening. So it's just by counting. Of course, they're small aircraft and it's not a big deal, but it's busy. And they talk to the FAA all the time about getting some money for um, some improvements to the airport. So they're a good client for what we want to do. Um, a little technical detail here. Everywhere in the world, the transponders that are installed transmit on 1090 megahertz, and they have a certain protocol that they follow. So every aircraft everywhere that needs a transponder, or sorry, everywhere in the world, this is happening. The United States happens to have a slightly older system that some aircraft are equipped with. It's acceptable in the United States. It's not acceptable anywhere else. So this can't be intercontinental aircraft. It just has to be local PA aircraft. But they can transmit on 978 megahertz. It's a slightly different protocol. The messages contain slightly different information, but both of them contain the information that we need. They both have latitude and longitude and ICAO address and all of that other stuff. So we're down. This is us down here listening to these transmissions. We built this stuff ourselves. This sequence of pictures is basically supposed to show you the stages of invention that we went through. So as you can imagine, it all started as a big pile of spaghetti on my desk at home. And then it became an installation at the College Park Airport, because that's the one closest to my university, but it was still kind of a mess. Then we took the mess and put it in a box and that's what got installed at, um, I think that's Ohio State, it's a little uh, snowy outside. Then we said, okay, we're not, 
the stuff is working, but it doesn't look very professional. Somebody probably doesn't want that in their airport. So we started trying to clean it up, and now we're actually fabricating boxes with uh, you know power supplies and fans and all kinds of stuff. So you can set it in an office someplace, and it actually looks somewhat uh, somewhat professional. The local uh, equipment is all Raspberry Pi based, so you have Raspberry Pis, you have uh, Radio receiver, SSR, software uh, defined, SDR, sorry, software defined radio filter so that you only keep the 978 and 90 megahertz stuff and you don't get bothered by other frequencies. And then out to an antenna someplace, a little uh, LED counter that's, that's allowing you to just look at the box and see how many aircraft on each frequency are being tracked at any given time. Um, and there's uh, Ethernet connections to the Raspberry Pi, so they'll speak to the rest of the world by Ethernet. Anytime you want to, you can plug in a keyboard and a monitor and see what's going on with these things, but you don't really need that. It's not a permanent part of the installation. Once they're up and running, we leave them there. Um, uh, we've updated the software probably 25 different times. It's fairly robust right now. I know the setup at College Park has been running for well over a year uninterrupted. No, the, the planes keep showing up on the map. They keep doing what they're doing. So we think we have the software to a relatively good place, but all of this stuff we invented. We invented the hardware setup. We invented uh, all of the software is custom written for our purposes. So that was a big part of the early part of the project was, was building the, the infrastructure. For the most part, ASD messages look like this. That's in hexadecimal format. So it's just this big number. Um, <coughs> contained in that big number, is the ICAO address. So every airframe has a unique, ICAO is an international aviation organization, international civil aviation organization. Every airframe has a unique ICAO address. If you know the ICAO address, there is a database somewhere where you can look up and you can figure out what year was that airplane manufactured, who manufactured it, who currently owns it, what N number, if it's in the United States, what N number does it have, if it's in some other country, what is the tail number on it, everything you want to know. Some aircraft, that you're not allowed to get to the database. As you can imagine, there are military aircraft and other kinds of aircraft. They all have ICAO addresses. Some of them are not in the database uh, that's available for public consumption, but they'll, they'll show up in other places. If you're looking carefully, you can probably see that the ICAO address as a hexadecimal number is buried right in the middle of this big hexadecimal string. So that's part of what's in there. But then there's all of this other junk, including the downlink format, the downlink format basically means um, there are several different kinds of messages that can be sent, some of them that we care about. Also, um, not all of the messages are downlink. Some of them are uplink. Some, some ground stations can communicate on these same uh, bands and send messages up to aircraft. We're not trying to get those messages. Don't care about those. So we only care about certain kinds of messages. And then it, one of the earliest things we learned, a big problem for our purposes for these data, is that they don't have any time indication in them. So when you hear one of these messages, you hear, okay, sometime fairly recently, this aircraft thought it was at this altitude, with this latitude and this longitude and this everything else, but when exactly was it there? Well, I don't know because it's not in the data. Of course, you know when you receive the message, and as long as you're sure that you are Johnny on the spot receiving the messages, then you can tag the message with timestamp. And then you know approximately when it was sent, you know, almost, almost perfectly. Yes, the airplane knows what time it is. It, for no other reason, it's connected to GPS. But for whatever reason, when they decided to define the message string, they did not say plug in the time, maybe because they weren't willing to rely on the aircraft itself to determine the time, but it's not in there, so we tag it with that person. Now, how much of the delay between the message time and the time stamp that you have? Well, the, um, the distance between the aircraft and the receiver divided by the speed of light plus the, the slight amount of latency on the, on, the decoding, <coughs> on the decoding, which is on the order of a millisecond, maybe. So, so with that timestamp, you can confidently uh, infer what uh, the massive time is. For all of the stuff that we're worried about, we're talking about aircraft that might be flying at a few hundred miles an hour. So a millisecond is nothing to us. So it, it makes absolutely no difference. That's right. If this were a different kind of operation, or this was, you know, 
ballistics, if we were talking about using missiles to try to intercept things, where relative velocities can be a lot higher than 600 miles an hour, something like that, it would be a big deal. For our purposes, um, just stamping it with the timestamp at which we received it is close enough. Good question. Very good question. Um, when you take the, the rest of this hex stuff and you sort of decipher it, and remember, this is what some of the 1090 stuff looked like. The 978 stuff looks a little bit different than this, but there's a way to decode both of them. Eventually, it ends up in a CSV file looking something like this. You have your timestamp. You have your ICAO address. You have latitude, longitude, altitude uh, in feet, ground speed in knots, track. So that's the compass heading with zero is north, and then you work your way clockwise from there. Um, Rate of climb, that's in feet per second, and then a call sign. And of course, you'll see, um, you'll see, um, this is the same aircraft showing up multiple times. And you'll see, so this is the Unix timestamp, so it's in units of seconds. You're getting about one message every half second. Um, sometimes um, it's not perfect. And in busier areas, and this is one of the, I guess it's a problem in the protocol. In busier areas, what will happen, every aircraft has its own time reference. Every aircraft says, OK, every half a second, I need to broadcast where I am. Well, they're all doing this at the same time. The messages are very short. But with enough aircraft in the same space, every one of them working autonomously, occasionally they will talk at the same time. And it's not one of these communication protocols where before you talk, you listen and you make sure the channel is empty. And if the channel is empty, then you try to talk. And maybe if you try to talk and you can tell that somebody else is trying to talk at the same time, and if they're both trying to do that, then one of you backs off. Those are all, I mean, that's how Ethernet and other things work. Um, the, that, the CAN network in your car, all those networks work like that. They're trying to prevent people from talking at the same time. This network, nobody cares. So everybody talks simultaneously. and. Yes, some of the messages will get garbled, but enough of the information will get through that it'll be good enough. Um, so we have to prepare ourselves for occasionally having missed, missed data points, which is okay. Um, also garbled data points, which are usually fairly easy to identify. I'll show you a couple of examples of that. In fact, there's one right here. So if you were to plug a monitor into the into the local Raspberry Pi and look at it, it would there would be one of these screens up and running, it would show you what it's currently tracking. So you can see in the US, all of the ICAO addresses start with, uh, with hex A. Uh, what frequency uh, or what are they squawking on a transponder? What is their call sign? Altitude, speed, heading, latitude, longitude. How many consecutive messages we've seen? Uh, what's the time um, since the last message? Everything here makes sense for most of these aircraft, except for this one labeled right here, corrupted data. First year, a little bit wary of it because it starts with an eight. That isn't necessarily a problem. It could be an aircraft that is registered in Europe or Asia or some other place. So eight by itself is not a problem, but at least it's a little bit of a yellow flag. Then you discover, okay, it's going 255 knots. That's you know that's okay. Heading of 182. Well, any heading is fine. An aircraft can fly in any direction at once. The latitude is down near the South Pole. That's a problem. The longitude is the almost the prime meridian. That's not a big deal, but I doubt there's an aircraft flying over the South Pole that I can observe from College Park, Maryland. That would be pretty miraculous. Um, and um, it's 975 feet under the sea, so that also seems problematic. So clearly, what happened here? Somebody sent some message, and then somebody else sent some message, and those two messages ended up on top of each other, and some ones and zeros got intermingle and uh, something bad happens. So that's one of the things that we have to do is try to apply some sort of filters for reasonableness. Like, well, okay, could it have possibly originated from anywhere around us? And you can check signal strength and some other stuff to, to, um, to determine that. We're using uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services, as our data infrastructure. This, I'm, I'm not going to try to explain every single detail on this picture, but it gives kind of a big overall view of just how much is going on from the data transmission and processing standpoint. Um, this part here sort of stands for our, our local 
data collection equipment. I'll try to point at the screen and I'll also try to use this pointer because I know I have two different audiences. And the data from those Raspberry Pis, they get sent up to AWS in two different ways. And the two different ways are very important. There's a real time way. So they send their information real time and we take that data real time. We process it through some databases, clean it up, do various things with it, and we stick it out on some real-time websites that you can watch and see what we're seeing. We have a mapping display, so you see all the aircraft on a map, just like if you look at FlightAware or something like that. Our map looks very similar to those. You see little icons of aircraft. In fact, I have a picture of it in here somewhere. It looks sort of like that. This is our mapping. So this is Ohio State, so there are two aircraft taxiing, one little plane flying, and one helicopter landing on the northeast part of the aircraft up here. There's a longer list of aircraft that were a little bit farther away or at other, other airports. But anyway, so that we built that application. There's a just sort of a text version of that, just a big table of what's going on with all the aircraft we can see. There's a, there's a dashboard that gives us some statistics about our Raspberry Pis. Temperatures, disk space remaining, uh, last time we had an update from them, stuff like that, so we can keep track of our system. There's also, uh, well, with this real time stuff, it serves the purposes of these websites, which are sort of to see what's going on right, right now, and then all of that data goes away. It just it, it disappears. More importantly, for analysis purposes, is this other pathway where the data get uploaded to our computing instance, they get <coughs> backed up decoded and stored and then applied to the Postgres database. So this is our archive and then this is the place where we can go back and query historical data and ask any questions we want. So over the last you know, months, how many aircraft came, how many went, how many did this, how many did that, what kind of aircraft were they, all of those kinds of things, that all can take place up there. Our Postgres database has all kinds of different tables in it. We have the master list of um, aircraft types and other information about aircraft models, engines, manufacturer of the year, all of that stuff that you get when you know the ICAO address. We have our raw ADSB messages here. You probably can't see this stuff, but this includes the lat, the long, the altitude, ground speed, track, call sign, all that stuff. We stitch those together into flights. So Every aircraft is sending a sequence of messages and we stitch all of those messages together. So we call that string of things a flight. Um, and uh, here's some more stuff about referencing uh, information about the individual aircraft. So all that's maintained on our database. We use for our own internal purposes. This is not a public interface. This is for us and for our you know, prospective uh, airport clients. They can tap into that database and do QGIS uh, visualizations of whatever they want. And they can ask for, you know, as many different aircraft as they want, whichever, whichever one of our airports they want, what time frame they want. They can filter by anything they want and then um, visualize that in this 2D perspective. You can color the docs to represent another um, dimension of the data that you want. Um, you can have other things, other components of the data that appear as graphs that accompany that picture. So in this particular case, we have altitude. This is rate of climb. This is ground speed. Um, this is at Ohio State. Any guess from the audience what this aircraft was doing? What story does this picture tell? Looks a little weird, right? Most of you have not been in, on an aircraft that behaves that way. If I had to guess, it's training. it's training. Remember, I said OSU has their own airport, right? So what is it? What is it doing? What kind of training is it doing? Is it doing touch and goes? Touch and goes, exactly. So, which you can see here, what did this aircraft do? Well, it, it was parked here, then it took off, then it flew around in a circle, and it pretended to land, then it took off again. Then it came around in a circle and pretended to land, then it took off again. This is not something regular aircraft do all the time, but regular aircraft need to know how to do, right? If you're on a regular aircraft and your airplane is getting close to the runway and all of a sudden they see a truck on the runway or another airplane starting to cross the runway or a giant flock of deer on the runway or whatever, you're going to pray that they know how to 
rather than land, take back off again. And that's not just something you can assume. You have to practice when you're learning how to fly planes. So at flight schools, you see people literally flying around in circles uh, and coming down, touching the ground, and taking back off again. Um, and so their altitude profile is going to look like up and down and up and down and up and down. And their speed profile is going to correlate with that quite closely. Because generally, when you're higher, you're faster. And when you're lower, you're slower. So this looks the same. And then the rate of climb is going to be positive when they're, when they're climbing and negative when they're descending. So this is going to go all over the place. So this is the sort of profile of an interesting flight that you would see at a flight school that would be quite different from what you would see in other places. This is just that text thing that I showed. You don't have to see all those numbers. It's just at any given time, we can see all the aircraft that we're, that we're tracking. We can filter by all kinds of different things. We can see what's going on with our system. That's that map. And that's what our dashboard looks like. So we're kind of seeing how many messages are we seeing. These numbers should be constantly changing if we're getting new messages. How many? You can see that we get by far the most of them on 1090. We see a much smaller fraction on 978. That's an older protocol. We can break them off into different classes. It's separated by airport. We. This is a picture that did not have our port airport, but now we have our port airport on this picture. Some details about our raspberry pies. You have to be careful with them. They can get too hot, which is why we build fans into the case now. Um, so we're tracking the core temperature, disk space. Um, it would be bad if any of them ran out of disk space because we leave them unattended, like I said, for a year. So I keep track of what's going on over there. I have a way to pull stuff off of there and archive it if, if we start running out of disk space, so we do that. We have a lot of cleaning that we have to do to our data. Here's a good example. There will be some time gaps in the data. We put our antennas at these airports. There are some blind spots occasionally uh, because we put them inside buildings. So maybe on the back side of the building, if the aircraft were transmitting from back there, we wouldn't see it through to our antenna because our antenna is not on the roof. It's inside a roof. Also, you'll get some gaps because there could have been another aircraft at the same time that was transmitting at you know, nearly the same times and a lot of data got corrupted. Eventually that gets cleaned up, but you'll see these gaps. There's another interesting artifact right here. This aircraft, what do we think this aircraft was doing? This is the altitude profile. What, what did it do? Take it's a takeoff, right? He's on the ground doing nothing. Then all of a sudden he's climbing, right? And if you look at ground speed, that's this one here. Um, it was pretty low. Then it increased for a while. And then all of a sudden it took off like a rocket. And similarly, ready to climb. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And then all of a sudden, all these positive numbers, right? What happened? Right here. It's an interesting little chunk of data. Did the aircraft fall in a hole and go underground for for uh, two tenths of a second? For two seconds. No. What happened? Pilots would know the answer to this question. So it turns out that the way that these transponders work, the instrumentation on the aircraft, if the ground speed is low enough. It presumes that you're on the ground. And if you're on the ground, it reports zero altitude. So it's reporting, when you're on the ground, it's reporting altitude <clears throat> above the field, zero feet above the field. As soon as you have some speed, it doesn't do that anymore. It determines its altitude using pressure altimeters, which means there's a model that takes into account the air temperature and the air pressure and deduces altitude from air pressure and air temperature using a standard atmospheric model. But if we all pay attention in our science classes, we know that the standard atmospheric model isn't always exactly right. Some days the pressure temperature relationship is a little bit different than what the model predicts. So it can pretend that there's a negative altitude. There really isn't. But that's what, on this particular day, the meteorological conditions would have suggested that. Eventually, it gets better. And so we know, for our purposes, at every one of our airports, we know what the field elevation is. And, but we know it uh, as, a, as a number of feet above mean sea level. So as soon as we see something like this, we can shift this whole part of the data to account for that discrepancy 
And in fact, then we can decide, do we want this graph to show altitude above the runway, which is what it's showing here, or do we want it to show altitude above mean sea level, which is just a standard way that you would talk about altitude, so actual pressure altitude. And you can do either one. Just once you slide this part relative to this part, then you just have to decide, well, are we going to slide the whole thing relative to the base elevation at the airport or not? And you don't have to make that choice ahead of time. All the data are sitting there on the analysis and you can decide. Do we want altitude above ground or altitude above sea level? Make your choice and then it'll slide the data accordingly. Yes, sir. Thank you. Why is there a still a jump after that negative value? Did the airplanes switch the sensor or up here? Yeah. Right. So I'm there's negative. probably a point at which rather than using the pressure altimeter, it's using the GPS altimeter. So so the airplane has many sources of well, at least two sources of altitude data, right? Um, and some of them have even a third because some of them have a downward facing um, it's not really an altimeter, but it's a distance sensor for measuring distance above the runway uh, as you're coming in for a, for a land, right? So if I had to guess, it would be that, but I think it can vary a little bit depending on the transponder. Um, the other possible explanation is that, is that this is actually quite close to zero, to zero peak, right? In fact, this is at the highest, uh, no, where is it? So that's, uh, that's close to that's, 2000. Yeah, so that can't be Ohio State because their field el elevation is only about, um, I think it's like <coughs> a quarter of five or six hundred feet above sea level. So if this were an airport where the runway was actually about 2,000 feet above sea level, well then this is exactly what you would expect, right? Um, as the zero point. So could uh, why didn't they do a, like sensor fusion to like make? Well, there's no they. There's us. <laughs> and we do. Is oh, yeah. This is what it looked like when we first saw it, and then we started fixing these things, right? But if you mean on the aircraft, yeah, on the aircraft, they, they I think did that. There's a tendency systems. to prefer raw data because fusion is always as much art as it is science, right? So, um, if somebody kind of prescribe the right way to do fusion, given that you have all different kinds of GPS receivers and all different kinds of altimeters and all this other stuff, is there a single right way to do it? I don't think so. I think they would prefer raw data, which is going to have artifacts, and then it's up to the people on the receiving end to process those artifacts and do something. But that, if, that they give case. you all the raw data from the sensor, different sensors, or just the, they, they give you one out of the three? We get, no, we don't get everything. So the aircraft knows everything. The ADSB format doesn't support multiple transmissions of competing understandings of altitude. There are other, for big planes, there are other protocols that they use to talk to other places where some of that information is contained in there. We don't have it on ABSB. Here's another thing we discovered. Um, if you looked at this altitude profile, what would you deduce? Raise your hand if you'd want to be on that plane. <laughs> yes, no. So I looked at this and I said there's two possibilities. Either this is a UFO that has a really crazy ability to spontaneously change its location, some technology that we don't have, right? Odd that it has an ICAO address, but somehow a UFO doesn't do this. Or there's really something faulty with the connection between the altimeter and the transponder and that we're getting bad data. So we started finding a very small number of these in our data, but they were fairly obvious when we found them. So we started sending these to the FAA saying, what is this? The FAA <coughs> gave us some assurance that they had seen this before. The other data makes sense. The speed makes sense. Rate of climb makes sense. Um, it is unfortunately somewhat common, not terribly common, but it can happen, where either a connection has come loose, something is wrong in the installation. And nobody knows it because for the most part, the GA aircraft, nobody's paying attention to the stuff that they're transmitting. We now have the ability to identify these locations. We send this information back to the FAA. They reach out back to the person who owns this airplane and they tell them, look, there's something wrong with your airplane. Your altimeter reading is 
it's, it's probably correct inside the airplane. Like you can probably, they would know if they were flying and if their own internal alt altimeter was doing this, they wouldn't fly that plane, I guarantee you. Um, but um, somewhere the connection between the altimeter and the transponder and the ADSB transmitter, something is going wrong there. Um, that shows up fairly often. So we're identifying those and helping them fix those. For the I see your hand just for a second. Um, for the purposes of our data, we did a study that said, well, wait a minute. Okay, so this is easy to distinguish. You could write an algorithm that could tell that this is an impossible altitude profile. So do we throw this flight away entirely or can we replace this with a suitable substitute? And the thing to keep in mind is the other thing we have in the ADSB data is the rate of climb data, which essentially is the time derivative of altitude. So missing the, the baseline, if, if the plane lands or takes off, you can always figure out what the baseline was supposed to be. So if you integrate uh, numerically the rate of climb information, you can get an altitude profile that makes sense. Um, it looks nice on this picture. Looking nice isn't good enough. So we went through a whole exercise where we had data that had good altitude data, but we pretended they didn't, and we integrated the rate of climb data and then matched that to what had been recorded in the altitude data after we baselined the, uh, the derivative. And uh, I thought I had, maybe I don't, I thought I had a picture in here that showed that. I guess I, I didn't, didn't put that one in. Um, but anyway, the point is, is that uh, if we can get a decent altitude it's more or less an estimated altitude, but if we can get a decent altitude from the um, from the rate of climb data, then we'll do that. Yes, sir. Oh no, I just wanted to know if you if if it was just commercial planes you were doing this with, or also private. It's private. It includes parts. private. So the rule is, if you want to fly in a given class of airspace, you have to have one of these. And the point is, is that the classes of airspace that you're trying to fly through are controlled by air traffic controllers. And they need your aircraft to be transmitting this data so that they can handle you and make sure you don't fly into other airplanes. So there are general aviation aircraft out there that do not have these transponders on them because they don't need them. They're never planning on flying into those airspaces. So in the middle of Nebraska, there's an airplane, there's lots of them, whose purpose is to take off, fly around a cornfield, spray some stuff on the cornfield, and then land again. They don't ever have to come into interaction with any other aircraft. They don't fly through any kind of airspace that's occupied by other people. They're not going to waste the money putting one of those up in an airplane. They don't need it. It's not required. Newer aircraft, for the most part, they're being installed by default. So eventually the fleet will get to the point where maybe everybody has it. Um, but um, there are quite a few private planes that intend sometimes to fly to some other airport and to fly into controlled airspace. And if they want to do that, they have to have one. They'll get in. If they flew in there without one of these, they'll still see them on radar. And when that plane lands, someone is going to go talk to them. And um, they may or may not be a pilot at the end of the day. If they make a habit of that. So that's, that would be a, a really big problem. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. Seems uh, there are some issues for the altitude plot, but there nothing happens with the speed plot. Yeah. So the that's a good point and so i don't know but when we reported this to the faa it seemed to make sense to them for whatever reason when there's a problem with these installations in the aircraft the problem seems to come from the altimeter not the not the speed although how does an aircraft determine its speed Since it's the same information that are contributing to both like really it's based on pressure right so and some, to some extent, they're both using some of the same sensors, but there's some differences along the way. And somehow it seems to be the altitude that is the one that is most susceptible to this. So that's a great question. Don't know the answer. But um, the FAA seems to be happy with our fix. If at some point they decide that they're not, then we'll just have to, to eliminate these cases. And they're fairly rare. So. I don't want to leave the impression that, you know, this is the kind of stuff we have to deal with all the time. In fact, we were surprised when we saw it. And we had built some of these visualization tools so that we could walk through flight after flight after flight. And when the pictures popped up and everything looked normal, we're like, oh, okay, this seems to be working. And then all of a sudden, one of these popped up and we're like, wait a minute, 
sequence is that? And then, then we had to, to start looking through the rest of the data and see how many more of these kinds of things there were. Um, so we ingest our data and we do, I'm not going to show all these things, all kinds of questions we ask, stuff about negative altitudes, we get to have one of those questions, field altitudes, is it a helicopter or not? Because helicopters fly very differently than regular aircraft do, so what you would come to expect from another, from a fixed wing aircraft, you're not going to see from a rotary wing aircraft. So lots of questions we ask, tags that we put on the data, lots of stuff like that. Uh, real quick, getting back to our airports, just so you can see some of the variety. This is what they look like. College Park only has a single runway. Ohio State has parallel runways, and this seldom used um, intervening runway. Republic has two crossing runways, and Grand Forks has uh, several runways. So kind of increasing order of complexity, if you want to think about it that way. But lots of different runway configurations. We can do simple stuff like Count planes. This is one of the things people want to know. Not that big a deal, but all of that information is in the database. Um, and so we can do it. We can tell them apart. So their ICAO address allows us to decide are they a glider, balloon. In Columbus, Ohio, you will see the Goodyear blimp every now and then. So that's kind of cool. Um, fixed wing, single engine, fixed wing, multi engine. So these are kind of airplane bridges to flying on, and then helicopters. Uh, we can tell lots of stuff by looking at the data ourselves, but what we really want is a computer to do all of this stuff for us. So one of the things that we are currently right in the middle of is building um, automated mechanisms for doing things like classifying the operation. So I showed you some pictures and I asked you what, what they were. And one of them you correctly identified touch and go operations. And another one you correctly identified a takeoff. And if we can do that successfully as humans, and we can collect enough examples of what those things look like and, and put together a, a training, a, a labeled training set, presumably we can teach a computer simply to recognize these things when we see them. So we can and we have. There are some, you know, the, the devil's always in the details. We did have a bunch of human pilots at Ohio State sit down and manually classify uh, a little over 7,500 flights. So we have lots and lots of flights that have been correctly classified by human pilots. Um, so somewhere in here is a training set or many different training sets, depending on how you want to training set. Um, there are some, like I said, there's some details. We have all, all these vectors of altitude and ground speed and stuff like that. They do have those gaps, so they're not uniformly sampled. So you have to be a little bit careful if you're if your neural classifier is planning on doing various linear things like taking delta this over delta that or whatever, um, since it's not uniformly sampled, you have to be pretty careful because the finite differences between two different pieces of that vector have very different interpretations if they were collected at very different times. You can put the time information in there as an additional dimension, or you could go back and resample. So one of the things we're thinking about uh, doing, we haven't fully tested this yet. I thought I had a picture of it, maybe I don't. We're thinking about taking these profiles, going back, interpolating, smoothing, and then resampling so that all of the data will be uniformly sampled. So then you kind of take time out of the equation. So that's an alternative. Um, that's part of the modeling exercise that we're going through right now. These are the categories that we assign. So touch and go, low approach, landing, and then a takeoff, takeoff, and then landing, single landing, single takeoff, or just taxi. So we have some aircraft that never even take off. They just turn on the, the motors, drive around, and turn off the motors. So that's kind of what the interface looked like for the people who were doing the manual classification. Uh, it's probably boring, you know. Look at something like this, figure out what it is, press a button, hit next. Get another one, look at it, figure out what it is, press a button, hit next. We had 7,600 of those. So, it's, you know, hired some some uh, students to do that, which was good. Um, that's uh, that's kind of how that, that played out. I think the 7,600, that's an, well, I guess that's an older number because it looks like we actually have close to 9,000 when you count across all of our, our airports. So um, clearly some of the operations are much rarer than others, which is, well, that becomes a problem for trying to classify. You can certainly overtrain on the frequent things and under train on the infrequent things and that's going to be a problem so you have to be very judicious about how you pick your training set. Um, 
one of our efforts uh, at one point this was the best model we had we're trying to do better than this but this is our confusion matrix for one of the um, one of our tests we had 94 percent accuracy uh, in the training stage which i'm hoping for better we had human beings that i think were 100 percent accurate so uh, and these are not they are noisy data i'm hoping to get much closer to 100 on the training data will be a little bit less on the testing that I'm, I'm willing to deal with. But even without trying very hard to get to this point, which I think is pretty good. Um, you see the big numbers are on the diagonal, that's what we want. So what we said it was and what it actually was agreed most of the time. There are a few discrepancies and uh, they happen with some of the rarer things. And that's not terribly surprising. They happen with the rarer things because the rarer things don't have enough opportunities in the training set to present enough <coughs> variety to be clearly distinguishable from the other things. So it's easy to mistake a rare thing for something else if you don't have the right training set. So we're working on things like that. Um, these are some of the more advanced steps. I said we're doing uh, interpolation, smoothing, resampling. We're also taking, um, we're doing some feature extraction. So rather than, than using the raw data, saying, well, let's pull some features out of the data. So linear approximate, piecewise linear things. Clearly, the, the touch and go profile, there's an obvious frequency characteristic for that signal. So you can pull out frequency characteristics where they exist. Other things like simple landings and takeoffs, they don't have any frequency content, but you can be able to recognize that by looking at it. So we can do um, frequency domain stuff uh, and add features to the classification process uh, just to try to speed it up, reduce the size of the data. We're doing all of that kind of stuff. Segmentation. I only have a few minutes left, so I've got to get through these last couple of slides. Segmentation is another. Um, another part. We want to be able to measure certain parameters of different aspects of the flight. So this is a this was a, a departing flight. It's missing some some pieces in here, but ignore that for now. It taxi came over here, took off, and then it was gone. Um, from the perspective of uh, what impact this particular airplane had on the capacity of this airport, it would be nice to know how long it sat here doing nothing but occupying the runway. It would be nice to know how long it was actually on the runway, which is partly a function of what kind of airplane it is, because it takes a certain time to get different airplanes off the ground. Um, and that's actually also a function of what the field altitude is. At higher elevations, the air is thinner, so you have to, it takes you longer before you can, before you have enough uh, lift to get the airplane off the ground. And then maybe the speed that you have once you get to the departure phase. There's lots of parameters you want to pull out from these different um, phases of the flight. And so what we're trying to do is segment the flights into these different um, aspects of so the taxi portion, the takeoff portion, and the departure portion. And again, while you could start by doing that with human beings staring at this stuff, I don't want to do that perpetually. We want a computer to do that. So the computer, we're currently working on training the computer to be able to distinguish these uh, different phases of flight. This might be a bit more particular to the individual airport because there are different flight patterns at different airports, different runway usages. So that and long and all of that stuff could be relevant here. If you'll notice when I was talking about the previous thing, trying to identify what type of operation it was, I didn't say anything about latitude and longitude. We we're hoping that we can train a model at say Ohio State where we have all of the manually classified data because that's where we have all the student pilots to help us. But that those profiles are representative enough of how airplanes at any airport would look when they take off or land or do stop and go or whatever, that that model can be transferable to other airports. We don't know the answer to that yet. And unfortunately, the only way to really know that answer is we're gonna have to go to some other airport and also manually classify a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, uh, operations at that airport. I don't mean physically go to the airport, but the, the data are all in the database. We'll have to classify them and then apply our model to those data and see if it comes up with the same answer. Yeah. So you are collecting data at the four airports. Yep. Why you only did the laboring for one airport but not others? Because that's where the student pilots were familiar. First set that access to a bunch of undergraduate students who were pilots. 
So he had a labor force who knew what they were talking about. Do you think you need to have pilots who are familiar with the other airports to do the laboring instead of? Maybe, or they might be able to do it just by looking at the data, but it was convenient just to use the ones who were there. So that's a good question. Um, and Farmingdale does have a flight school, so maybe we could use, but their students are not students of a university that we're attached to. So it's easier, it's easier for us because Ohio State's involved, just hire Ohio State undergrads and put them to work in classifying. Yeah, or you, can, or you can check if Ohio students can do job of correctly first and then let them do the job. Yeah, they could do it for other, yeah. That, okay. So somehow somebody who knows a lot about flying would have to say, yeah, if you, you look at it, it looks, <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. So feel the, you know what you're talking about, so go ahead and do it. Yeah. It's probably obvious to somebody like Seth, who's a pilot, I'm not a pilot, so I, I'm hesitant to presume expertise where it may or may not exist, but he may be happy doing that, so I'm happy. Um, so, okay, just last couple of slides real quick. <clears throat> Approach speeds, um, we're measuring these. Um, basically, we're, we're putting bounding boxes on the ends of the runway, and then you're, you're, uh, you can measure the speed. What we wanna know is the speed as the aircraft is, is crossing different runway thresholds. So that's all possible with our data. You can distinguish, for example, uh, speeds that tend to prevail on different runways and, and, and in different directions. And one of the interesting things about Ohio State is that the training traffic, for the most part, do their stop and goes up on the north runway. They park down here, so they will take off down here, then they'll fly around in circles up here, then they'll come and land back down here. But their, the profile for the operations on here, because it's primarily a training place, is different than the profile down here, because this includes not just student pilots who are learning how to fly and who are doing unusual <coughs> operations, but regular itinerant aircraft, uh, jet, jet aircraft, small jets that are coming in and landing, they're going to have a different speed profile than your typical training aircraft doing something goes up here. And you can see that um, when you look here at the data. Are you? Pacific. Pacific. Okay. What time are you leaving? That sounded like so. Hi, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, two last things. I'll burn through these really quickly. We're estimating runway occupancy time. So how long was the runway busy serving a particular aircraft on landing or departure? Again, by, uh, by runway, by airport, and one of the things that we're not very far along on, but we think we have some good ideas about, is inter-arrival time. So at some point, this really gets to the question of capacity. How quickly can you land aircraft or have aircraft take off in rapid succession if you are doing the best that the airport can do? It's hard to measure because you can only see what happened. You can't see what might have happened. So what happened on any given day is was clearly possible. What you never know is, well, what more could have been possible if more people wanted to be there? So measuring capacity. You can measure flow. You can't measure capacity. You might be able to look at some histograms of, of flow, which is what we're looking at here, counts, and say, well, okay, you know, at least at your low inter-arrival time, so you, these are your high flow rates, um, where does it sort of fall off? These things are really rare, so it must have been really quite exceptional for two aircraft or three aircraft to be able to follow each other this closely. Um, this seems more like a practical, um, sustainable value or something like the pattern because it tends to happen fairly often, but it's a fairly high rate of, of um, seeing the aircraft. So that's one of the questions that we can answer. So moving forward, all those things that I talked about, clustering the flights into different phases, adding more airports. We're going to add a high altitude airport here pretty soon, and then continuing our work on these things. So, if you had the impression that this was a work in progress, it is. Um, I think it's got a lot of really cool components to it. It's a fun, fun project to work on because we got to build stuff, then we get data out of the stuff that we built, then we get to analyze the data. Um, so it's a it's a cool project and. Last but not least, our acknowledgement, next door three, um, and the work was funded by FAA. So I run right up against the time. I'm happy to stay and answer questions if anybody has to leave. That's understandable, of course. 
Do we have more questions from? We're able to take some in person, yes, sir. Um, you mentioned that the, the accuracy of the manual transportation is 100%. I'm, I'm kind of curious how many are still in Paris? Well, we, I, I'm cheating when I say that. There were some profiles that when the student pilots looked at them, they couldn't tell what they were. Okay. So now, there, there is some error, also like a variation in the student classification results. We have not done an exercise where we have multiple people look at the same profile and see if they come up with the same answer. I suspect they would. Um, because it would be, I mean, it would be hard for you to imagine a situation where somebody, one person thinks something is a landing and another person thinks it's a takeoff. I, I'm joking a little bit, but um, I don't, I don't foresee that happening. Uh, we do still have some noisy data, like there were just too many gaps, too much uh, message traffic conflicting with each other. So in some cases, there's just a few points and you're looking at them and you say, I don't have any idea what that is, right? Those flights probably should just be filtered from the database to begin with. It's not that they're a real thing and that we don't know what it is. It's that they're a real thing whose data got corrupted so much that we can no longer tell what it is. So it shouldn't even be in the database. It's unfortunate because it's an operation that happened and we're never going to know what it was. But that's one of the things we have to tell. Yeah, not going to include those kind of data when they work training. Yeah. No, so the point would be only include the ones that we have accurately classified, which is why I am saying I think the human beings can do 100% because we only include the ones that they are really confident in. Um, then once we apply that trained network to new data, we're going to have to make sure that we first filter out all of those weird things. But it's not hard to to look at really oddball data and say, look, we don't know what this is, but there's no discernible pattern here, so get rid of it. Um, and then the ones that are left, try to infer what those were. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions from online audience? Put up their faces. <laughs> Most of them. Okay. Hi, Seth. Can you see us? I can hear you and see you. Sorry, I was only to, able to catch the end of it, but I'm sure Dr. Lovell covered everything with 100% accuracy. That's right. <laughs> but I chose not to say the things that were inaccurate. And I said nice things about you, too. So. Yeah. Thank you for organizing, you, you, and thanks to Dr. Lovell for presenting. Oh, my pleasure. We are very glad to have Dave, and I think this is a fantastic project that both of you are working on. We have a, a website for the project that I'll, I'll be happy to share with anybody who wants it. And um, one of the important added values that it has down at the bottom is it has a list of all the papers that have so far uh, come out of this. We've been busy presenting at conferences for the most part, but we, we uh, we've been trying to share what we've been doing. We've got some good feedback by that process. People have alerted us to um, different possibilities, even opened up some slightly different audiences. One of the things that we discovered as soon as we were working at Ohio State was that the flight school itself was actually quite interested in the data, not from the perspective of the airport wanting to um, you know, justify capacity improvements, from, but from the perspective of the flight school wanting to understand how its students are flying the airplane. Because they can watch them, they can sit in the airplane but they don't have numerical data. They can't go back historically and say, well, look, our, our student pilots tend to do this, or what do students tend to do compared to experienced pilots, or just <clears throat> how much activity do we have? How many times is our fleet being taken out? How many, you know, how much work is each of these aircraft being put through? They have lots of interesting questions that the, that the, um, that the training school might be interested in. That's not the main part of our job. Um, so, we did, we asked the FAA, we said, look, we're getting some inquiries from the flight training direction. If we have some extra time, do you mind if we help them, give them some tools, give them some access to the data? They said, fine. So we did, we wrote one paper on, you know, sort of what's the perspective on these data from the, or what can you do with these data from the perspective of a flight school, which is different than our normal uh, pitch that we're making. So that was kind of cool. 
It sounds like you have a gold mine, and your obsessed will get rich very soon. A good what? <laughs> Commercialize this. Oh, well, so that's that's possible. Absolutely. Um, we're not the only ones who are interested in that. And because we've been presenting at conferences, we have started getting inquiries from other businesses that already exist. Like I said, getting access to ADSB data itself is quite easy. Yes. So anybody in their garage could decide to start a business like this. Um, I think the question is the, um, you know, how much how much expertise and skill do you put into analyzing the data and, and, and doing it the right way? So we won't, yeah, there's maybe a space there. We won't be the only one. And someone could beat us for sure. Okay. We'll try not to lose, but we might lose. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Dave, for this You're fantastic welcome. presentation. If no more questions, so we'll just call it today. And then um, I don't think they can do the big house. And thank the audience online as well. We can have a big house virtually. <laughs> um, just want to let everybody know that so we have a speaker next week, but unfortunately he has some family emergency, so we have to postpone that to December 3rd. That, so because of that, we will have no seminar next week. Okay, you get your time back, which is good. And with that says, it's all for today. And thank you very much. I'll see you the week after. Thanks. All right.